artificial intelligence that evaluates traffic and can prevent congestion. Autonomous flying vehicles that communicate with each other. It all sounds pretty cool, but do innovations like this really make travel better for us? What is the future of smart mobility today on Shift? A hundred and fifty hours in traffic every year. That's the reality for the average person from London or Chicago. That's almost an entire week stuck in your car, waiting. Congestion is a huge problem in many big cities, but what if we could leave the road behind altogether? A startup from India is developing a flying taxi for two, barely larger than a conventional car. In Brazil, it's hoped that vehicles like this will be on the market by 2026. In autonomous flight mode, this model will carry six passengers up to 100 kilometers. In Japan, this single-seater is taking to the skies. In Israel, a startup is testing air taxis for medical emergencies and transporting patients to hospital. And German company Volocopter wants to ferry people around at next year's Paris Olympics. The Vertical Flight Society estimates that there are over 700 different designs for electric vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts, or eVTOLs, from nearly 350 companies worldwide. Other than helicopters, which often run on kerosene, most flying cars use electric motors. eVTOLs are also quieter than helicopters and thus more suited for urban areas. And because they don't emit carbon dioxide, they are more eco-friendly too, assuming the electricity comes from sustainable sources. However, the shorter range coupled with the weight of the batteries means that most designs can only carry two passengers. There are undoubtedly some challenges to overcome until we see flying taxis in our cities. There are many regulatory and safety questions still unanswered, and infrastructure for takeoff and landing still needs to be built. So it might be a while before we can kiss the traffic jam goodbye. But another mobility revolution is on the cast of a breakthrough. Fully autonomous robot taxis are making an appearance in the streets of San Francisco. Driverless cars like this one are a common sight here in famously tech-friendly San Francisco. Cameras, radar and LiDAR technology continuously scan the car's surroundings. The cabs use cloud-based map systems to navigate their way through the city. But the technology isn't perfect. Cars don't always wait where they should, and often stop when they get confused, blocking traffic. I don't know why we're stopped. Accidents have happened. One car crashed into a fire truck in San Francisco, sparking protest, especially amongst taxi drivers. They are a menace. They stop unexpectedly. They actually have broken the law many times. Uh, we, we see them uh, signal one way and then go another way. Sharon Givanazzo is more convinced. Her nonprofit is partnered with an autonomous car provider. And for a blind person, no driver means no discrimination. One of the things I found out with taxis and rideshare services, because I choose to have a guide dog to navigate the world, is they will leave me standing on the side of the street. And they will cancel rides. Even after they pull up and they see the dog, they don't want to have the dog in their vehicle. Whereas here, there's no opinion because there's no driver. And autonomous vehicles can navigate traffic more smoothly than a human being, she says. When you're like, <gasps> or you know that sudden stop that's made or you know, you feel people swerving and people honking at you and not being able to see what's going on. It's, it's fearful, it really is. I've never had one fear sitting in one of these. I just say that it's welcome to the future. So far, robo-taxis are something of an experiment. And not all people in San Francisco want their city to be a test track. But it seems they are here to stay. Autonomous vehicles are being tested worldwide. From VW's rollout of driverless minibuses in Germany to China's driverless cabs, it's a race for supremacy. But driver assistance systems aren't welcome everywhere. 
in China. Tesla drivers aren't allowed to park in certain government or military areas. Their cameras and sensors scan a little too much of the environment. Modern vehicles collect vast amounts of data, all in the name of safety and convenience. But can a vehicle know too much about us? Is your brand new car collecting information on your sex life? If you're in the USA and driving a Nissan or a Kia, it just might be. That's according to the terms and conditions there. Modern cars are equipped with cameras, trackers and microphones. They can access a phone's data when it's connected to the car. Data is valuable, and car companies know that too. The Mozilla Foundation found all 25 car brands it investigated were collecting far more data than necessary. In their words, it was a privacy nightmare. According to the study, 84% of companies shared personal user data with third parties. 76% even profited from it. So, if you want to keep your private data to yourself, make sure to use onboard apps sparingly and only link your smartphone if you really need to. The data gathered by your car can be useful to us, though. It can help us get from A to B faster and more safely. Take a look at this project from Europe. Cities and transport agencies are collecting more traffic data than ever before with cameras, sensors and other technologies all being deployed. The aim? To optimise commutes and reduce the number of unused vehicles on the road. Vianova is a micro-mobility agency based in Paris, specialising in data on scooters and bikes, modes of transport which reduce congestion and emissions. We uh, realized that, uh, of course, uh, these uh, new modes of transport were bringing uh, great benefits uh, to citizens, but at the same time uh, bringing a lot of chaos uh, on the streets uh, that uh, cities uh, were struggling to, uh, to deal with. Recently, mobility companies and public transport systems have begun compiling vast amounts of raw data. This data is then used by cities as they see fit. A lot of industries today uh, have uh, massive amounts of data that they don't know what to do with uh, yet. Data analysts then collect and aggregate everything into maps like these, while agencies like Vianova visualize the data. Their maps are responsive and interactive. This provides different kinds of anonymized information on residents' movements, which is useful for public authorities cities would be uh, able to understand uh, which areas of their uh, territory is more used uh, in terms of trips uh, departures or trips uh, arrivals. They will also be able to better understand the mobility patterns from point A to point B. And in that regard, they will be able to analyze whether these trip patterns are using a certain kind of infrastructure. So for instance, is it using bike lanes or bus lanes or just pavements? And then based on this analysis, we'll be able to plan uh, the missing infrastructure. Belgium's capital Brussels works with data analysts to get a better overview of the usage of e-scooters and rental bikes in the city. Brussels has seen one of Europe's most significant increases in shared mobility concepts. Data analytics helps Brussels city planners better understand how mobility operators use public spaces and how best to regulate them. We regulated much higher than before. Um, so starting from 2024, there will be less vehicles, less providers, more strict rules in terms of parking. The city is working on a sustainable mobility plan. And if all goes well, digital solutions like this will become more common across Europe. It's a solid place to start, but for many in the tech industry, it's a bit bland. They'd rather conjure up the really big ideas. We spoke to tech writer Paris Marx. Instead of kind of really mundane things like invest in buses and, uh, you know, think about how we uh, distribute street space and maybe make some cycle lanes, 
it sounds a lot more attractive to say, oh, the cars are going to start driving themselves and we're going to make this new tunnel system for transportation and we're going to have flying cars finally. Investors and media can't get enough of bold high-tech new transit projects. One of the most glaring examples is Hyperloop, a high-speed, above-ground vacuum tube popularised by Elon Musk in 2013. British billionaire Richard Branson, owner of Virgin, also supported it. In 2017, construction began. Passengers were to travel 1,000 kilometres an hour across the US, India and the Middle East. But the closest this came to materialising was a single test reaching just 160 kilometres an hour. And the costs were far greater than predicted. Undeterred by the failure above ground, Musk opted to go underground. First, he pledged to dig elaborate systems of tunnels under cities where 16-person self-driving pods could zip around with ease. That quickly became a pledge to develop a system of so-called skates, which would sweep electric cars across towns at speeds of up to 200 kilometres an hour. What did end up being built in the end was the loop, a one-way tunnel for Teslas to meander through at a mere 64 kilometres an hour. Well, at least it exists. It is mainly just an, an attraction for Teslas. You know, it's a way to sell Teslas. It's not really affecting traffic. It's not really solving transportation problems. It's really, I call it, a Disneyland ride for Tesla fans. Despite the ill-fated glory projects, the loop is to be expanded to almost 50 kilometres. The projects play to the imagination and Ghana capital. But can it solve traffic problems? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. So if big tech won't solve our traffic problems, who will? If you ask me, we shouldn't just sit back and wait for flying cars to come save us. It's always best to start small with the realistic ideas that can actually make a difference. Otherwise, we could end up waiting years for big tech to become affordable. As for me, I'll be taking the tram home for now. How do you like to travel? Do you have good public transport in your neighborhood? Let us know. See you soon. Bye-bye.